It's not only a remarkable introduction, but it used to be in the old days to give a lecture required a piece of chalk and a blackboard. Now it takes a village, uh, 57 people, high technology, uh, to give the same talk uh, that I used to give when I was a kid. Uh, I'm so happy to be here and so happy so many of you have come. I know it's Passover. Uh, I know it's the women's championship game. I know it's raining. Uh, and so it makes me feel really good that you all came. Uh, what I want to do is a lot of things today, and I think we have an hour and a half uh, to do them in. Um, I, I do want to thank the, some of my former students and dear friends and, and the publishers of my textbook, Psychology and Life and Core Concepts in Psychology, from Alan Bacon across the town. Uh, I'm going to spend some time with them tomorrow. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, let me begin back on April 28, 2004. That's where the Lucer Effect was born because I was in Washington. Um, I belonged to an organization called the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. Uh, the president of every one of the 60 major scientific societies, chemistry, biology, physics, et cetera, et cetera, and psychology, it's the only soft, soft science, uh, uh, meets uh, twice a year there. And I was actually elected president of, of that group, so I was president of the presidents. And while I was in Washington at this meeting, uh, I turned on the television, which I rarely do, I rarely have time, and here were these horrific images on, on 60 Minutes. And these were the images coming out of Abu Ghraib. Uh, uh, people piled up naked in, in pyramids, and the famous one with the guy on, on a box with the, with the electrodes on his head. Uh, pictures of dogs, you know, about to attack prisoners. Picture after picture, and it was incredible. And then what was more incredible was the soldiers put themselves in the pictures. Not only male soldiers, but female soldiers. And this was incredible. How could, you know, why would anybody do, what were they thinking? The moment you're in the picture, you're automatically guilty. Uh, and then immediately after the showing, up comes the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Myers, saying, it's a few bad apples, a few rogue soldiers. We have no evidence it's systemic. The military is great, and on and on and on and on and on. And President Bush got on right away and says, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Paren, it means we're never going to get to the top of this. Uh, and, and on it went. Well, the, what was done was really inexcusable. It was not inexplicable. And I was shocked, but I was not surprised, because I saw all of those images before. Not the pyramid, not the naked pyramid, but prisoners stripped naked, prisoners with bags over their heads. Uh, guards making prisoners engage in sexually degrading activities. Those were part of the Stanford Prison Experiment 35 years ago. And so what I knew about the Stanford Prison Experiment, which I'm going to get, describe in some detail today, and I do it in excruciating detail in the book, 10 chapters worth, is that I knew on August 14, 1971, that every boy who went into that prison was a good apple, because we gave them psychological tests, et cetera, et cetera. And what, I, what the study is all about is how good people can be corrupted by a situation. So I said, before I'm, I'm ready to accuse American soldiers of being bad apples, I really would like to know something about their personality, but more importantly, I'd like to know something about the barrel. But, but how, is I, how is I going to do that? I'm a professor, this is Baghdad, this is all this over there. And so a student of mine from introductory psych at Stanford, uh, working for NPR, also remembered, I showed those pictures in my class, tracked me down, I got on NPR, and I said, I'm countering the bad barrel, bad apple uh, metaphor with the bad barrel. Well, that got stirred up. They, they love sound bites in the media. And one of the people who was listening was Gary Myers, who was the uh, legal counsel for one of the soldiers, Sergeant Chip Frederick. He calls me up and says, we'd like you to be on our defense team. I didn't have time to get involved in that, and I said, of course, yes, sure. Because now I could find out about the guy, I could find out about the situation, and I could also find out about what was the system that created that situation. So I, I then switched from being a psychologist to an investigative reporter, and that's what I'm going to talk about today in part. Um, so my talk is, uh, actually before I did the book, I call this the Lucifer Effect, and we'll see why. And it's really understanding is the key word how good people, or could be ordinary people, average people, normal people, first begin to behave in ways that we could 
we could label as evil, as bad. Um, the question about why do people go wrong is a question we've asked from time endlessly. Philosophers ask, theologians have asked, historians have asked, psychologists never ask those kind of questions. We like to ask very specific questions because we have a lot of very specific techniques for answering them. And we leave these big questions up to the other people. Um, a little aside, uh, when I was a, a student at Brooklyn College where I did my undergraduate work, I wanted to be a psychologist as a freshman because I had been a kind of street psychologist growing up in the Bronx because it's all about street smarts and who you can trust and who you can't trust. And, um, <clears throat> until I took my first course in introductory psych <clears throat> and I got a C. C is not so bad except I never got a C in any other course from kindergarten through graduate school. Uh, and, I f and I got to see because the text was boring, the lectures were boring, the tests were boring, and psychology was boring. This is 1950. And so I said at the time, if I ever was a teacher, I would never give a boring lecture. If I ever wrote a book, I would never give, write a boring book. And if I ever did psychology, I would never do boring psychology. And so I switched into sociology, anthropology. And they asked big questions like that. But they never have an answer because they have no, no good method. <laughs> So I switched back into psychology in senior year and I said, you know what? Why don't we ask the big question and then use the techniques that psychologists have? Experimental research, uh, uh, really good assessment. Uh, and so I realized that we leave the study of institutions to anthropologists, to, to, to um, sociologists, to political scientists. And psychologists study the scientific behavior of individuals. And nobody studies the person in the institution. We spend our life in institutions, in families, uh, in, in uh, schools, uh, in hospitals, in prisons, uh, and then we in jobs, and then we end up in old age homes. At least some people do, and nobody's really studying how do how institutions shape individuals, and in some cases, how do individuals shape institutions. So that's been my my long term uh, goal in development. So I want to start with solution from introductory psych. Many of you know it, it's from the, the artist M.C. Escher. And if you look at it for a minute, it's a figure ground illusion. Some of you will focus automatically on the white and see angels. Some of you will focus on the black and see devils. Take a minute just to look and see if you, and then see if you can see both. So if you focus on the white, you see his wings and he has a little tutu and, and they're floating around. It's a world full of goodness and angels. Now for a minute, let's focus in on the black. And there's the world full of devils with the horns. Uh, here's the horns, the wings. And it tells us several things. The world is filled with good and evil. The world has always been filled with good and evil. The world will always be filled with good and evil. Because good and evil are part of the human condition. But it tells us something else. Those of you who have some religious background will remember that God's favorite angel was Lucifer. Lucifer means the light. In the scriptures, he's called the morning star. We, didn't know, we don't know why he was the favorite, but he was the favorite, favorite son. And when God created Adam, God said all angels have to bow down before Adam. All angels have to honor him. Lucifer said, no way. I'm prior to him, I'm an angel. He's immortal, and I'm, I refuse. <clears throat> and so that's the sin of pride and the sin of disobedience. And God sends Michael the archangel uh, to, to battle Lucifer and other angels agree with Lucifer and Lucifer loses, they kick him out and paradoxically it was God who created hell. And of course, what did, what did the devil do? And so this is the ultimate cosmic transformation of God's favorite angel into the devil. Can't, it can't be more extreme transformation. <clears throat> and what does the devil do? The devil proves he was right and God was wrong. How does he do it? He shows how easy it is to corrupt Adam and Eve. Have a little snake, says, eat the apple. She eats the apple, she tells the guy, hey, I ate the apple, you eat the apple too. I don't want to go down alone. And, and so he was right. You should not honor Adam uh, because he's corruptible. Uh, and so, so that's our, so part of my mission is to uh, recover the reputation of Lucifer. Uh, 